Okay, I am Michael Homer. I'm going to be talking about Grace. Grace is a new, object-oriented, open-source educational programming language. <laughs> Some of you were disappointed already. I'm going to try to finish even a little bit early, earlier than usual, because I suspect there are going to be a lot of questions at the end. So hopefully we'll finish really early. So some of you may be wondering this question, uh, why would you do this? Why would you do it now in particular? There's a few reasons. One of them is that Java at this point is now 20 years old this year. Python is probably the second most common language used for teaching, and it is actually even older. C++ is still holding uh, its own, and it's even older again. There's also a lot of people using Lisp, which is even older again. All of these languages have a lot of history. They have a lot of backwards compatibility. The state of the art has moved on since they were created. And to an extent, they've moved with it. Sometimes they've even been part of the state of the art moving on, which is great. But after 20 years, 20 years of patches start to look like patches. So we've reached a point where if you want to teach the features that are in Java, Java is actually not the best language to do that in. Java is a bad language for teaching Java with, which is not the ideal position to be in. The, 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 the key example there is something like generics. They had to put them in in a way that's broken because they put them in the right way, which they knew how to do, then they would have broken compatibility with all their old code. So there's these weird corner cases in all these languages where students run into a problem where you try to combine generics and arrays in a way that doesn't quite work, and you get confused, you get stuck, you get... Yeah, you get stuck. So we've had 20 years of advancement in programming languages. We've also had 20 years of advancement in education research. In fact, even more than that, these languages are not educational languages. All the languages that are currently used for education, for the most part, at least, one exception, are not designed to be educational languages. Java is a large-scale industrial language. Python is an industrial language. C++ is an industrial language. They have no intention at all of being useful for teaching. So we can incorporate not just advanced education research, but things that were known 20 years ago, things that were known 30 years ago, and aren't in any of these languages. That's what we're going to try to do. So to the end, we set out some principles that our language should follow. There is a secret hidden principle, which is steal as much as possible. So this isn't going to be a language that has lots of new, exciting features in it. In fact, it has almost no new, exciting features in it. So this may be a very boring talk, and I'm sorry. What we do have is features that have shown themselves to be useful in existing languages or in current languages for teaching or, or in industry. And we try to incorporate those features in a way that complies with what we know about teaching, what we know about teaching programming in particular, and what we are best able to fit together into a cohesive whole of a language. So here's some principles. We want simple programs to be simple. So you shouldn't have more in your program than actually represents the concepts that you personally, right now, are trying to express. We want to have an understandable semantic model. So there should be a single, overarching, cohesive model of language that a student can internalize and look at any code at all written in this language and follow what it does. Parse it themselves in their head, figure out where the control flow is going to go themselves in their head if they want to. Not that they should have to, but they should be able to because you should have a single semantic model, which all the other languages don't. They have weird special cases. We want to support different teaching orders. There's a few reasons for that. One of them is simply that we don't know, and I don't think anyone knows, what the right way to teach programming is. There are a lot of different ideas, and there are people who will argue strenuously for every one of them. There's even research. I can point you to peer-reviewed published research that says that every one of them is better than every other one of them. All mutually contradicting each other, sometimes even in the same edition of the same conference or the same journal, Java is better than Python. Python is better than Java. We don't know. The other part of this is a pragmatic reason. And the pragmatic reason is these people with these strongly held views exist, and we are in the dog food business. So what I mean by that is the customer is not the consumer. The consumer of our language is the students. The customer, the person who chooses what's going on, is the instructor of the course, the people who are writing teaching materials, and so on. We need to entice them to use our language, and if we tell them, no, actually, that way you want to do that's wrong you can't do that, then they won't. So pragmatically, we want to support these approaches. Educationally, we don't know any better. If we did, maybe we'd show something different, but we don't. We also want to be a general purpose language. 
So what I mean by that is it's not a micro-world language. It's not a language where you only have a limited expressive domain. It's a language that, even if you perhaps wouldn't use it to write your giant server applications, conceivably you could. It doesn't have any limitations in what you can write. It is a language that you could continue using indefinitely. And that's quite important because there's a, a lot of education research into what they call transfer of learning. Transfer of learning is the idea of applying what you've learned in one skill domain, so say in learning one programming language, to a different but related skill domain, like learning a second programming language. There's a lot of teaching approaches that rely on, okay, we're going to start you out in Python, and then after a couple of months, you're going to move to Java. We're going to start you out in Scratch, and then we're going to move you into Python. All these things exist, and all of them, I want to be careful what I say here, uh, all of them don't work. So what we know from education research for decades now is that relying on people to automatically have this sort of free transfer of learning between different domains just doesn't happen. You need to build up quite a high level of expertise in that first domain, in that first language, before you get any benefit at all out of having learned that before you do the second skill. So you start out with Python, you do that, use that for a, a month, you're, you're okay at it, you switch to Java, and you have to learn to program all over again. We don't want that. We want to be able to support students throughout the learning process so that they can continue using this language until they've actually reached the level of competence that's required to switch on to another language if they want to at that point, or keep using it forever. Both fine. So let's look at some examples of how these principles show up in the language in action. We have this no incantations rule. So what I mean by incantation is something like this. Public, static, void, main, string, square bracket, args. That's an incantation. That appears in every single executable Java program. It's actually longer than the second line, well, the one, two, three, whatever, fourth line, that actually does what the program's doing. So when you write Hello World, you've written more to make the compiler happy than you have to make you happy. That's a bit of a problem. Now, when I call an incantation, I want to be careful that I'm not implying they're meaningless. That is very meaningful. So we have it there, in fact, six distinct concepts in that, for just that one line. We have public, static, void, main, string, square brackets. Six concepts. If you change any one of those in the source text, your program will no longer work. They're all meaningful here. They're all meaningful elsewhere in the language. But what they're for right here is making the compiler happy, making the language happy. They're not for making you happy. So you have two options here. One is that you just, is there actually, you're going to teach people on their very first day, you're writing Hello World, here's what a static method is. And to do that, you're going to have to explain what a non-static method is, which you haven't exposed them to yet. You're going to have to explain what void is, which is a tricky concept to get across in the first place. All these things are a problem. Or you have an alternative. You can say, okay, just, just put it there. It's fine. That is, there to make the compiler happy. It doesn't matter. Just ignore it. And that's a problem because it actually leads to them using it as an incantation. So one of the, the big problems that I see with students teaching uh, when we teach Java is that they do treat lots of things in incantation. They have a lot of cargo code practices. We just, this bit of code worked over here, let's copy it in here. So commonly that has the form of, say, copying a static field declaration into the local variable. And that obviously doesn't work. In yes. my experience, the, the, it starts as an incantation. And then in the educational process, eventually the students are taught what they actually need. And so I think with, uh, one potential thing that they could learn from that is things that they see as, as incantations are actually semantically relevant, and they could learn about them if they wanted to. So, yeah, so a comment from the audience that is that people will eventually learn what these concepts mean, and they will. They will eventually be taught what these mean. Right at the start, though, they don't know what it means. They don't want to know what it means. And you can't realistically teach them what it means at this point. So this is an incantation to them. The problem is that they will then use them as incantations for a while, and then they'll get stuck. And when they get stuck, they don't catch up. So one of the other things we find in education, or programming in particular, is that people get a little bit behind, and then they get a lot behind, because there's just this constant building concepts on each other. So here's going to be our first Grace program. It's the same program as before, but it's in Grace. This is also a valid Python program, a valid Perl program. This in particular is not novel or interesting in itself. We've applied the same principle throughout the entire language, as far as possible, so that you don't have anything appear in your program that you want personally right now read to deal with as part of doing what you're trying to do. We want an understandable semantic model. So I said at the top that this was an object-oriented language. So to keep our semantic model simple, everything is an object. There are no primitive types, there's no anything else. Everything's an object. <laughs> everything you can do with those objects is a method. 
So you have all these standard metatypes here. You can have a dotted meta call, you can have implicit cleavers, you can have operators methods. We have infix binary methods and uh, prefix unary operators, operators both of those. And field accesses are also the method sends, the method requests, the method calls, whatever you want to call them. All of them go through the same dispatch semantics. The one at the bottom is the most interesting one here. So if you're familiar with Smalltalk or Newspeak or one of the languages in that family, you will have seen something like that before. Otherwise, this may be new to you. This is one of the more unusual features in the language, but it's really useful. That's a multi-part method name. So that's one method called between and that takes some arguments and does some stuff. What let's just do is something like this. So these are control structures of Grace. You have if then else, and there's a while loop. So if then else there is actually a method call. That is a method, if then else. It takes a Boolean, so the result of that expression, x less than zero, and then two blocks. So a block is written in braces there, that's a first class function, a lambda, all these things. It's a bit of code that you can hold on to, execute later, not execute at all, execute multiple times. Sorry, I can assign a, uh, the, the comment of a set of curly braces and end up with a column. You, you, well, you get an object. Everything's an object, so you get an object that hasn't applied. Sorry, I can't hear when these guys down here are talking, so. Yeah, I'm sure. Have to repeat it or get the microphone yeah. So, what we have at the bottom is a while loop. The while loop syntax is a little bit unusual if you're familiar with other curly bracket languages, and that's because we want to keep that semantic model simple. So while has curly braces around the condition. That's because the condition is evaluated multiple times. In most languages, while is a special case. It's a special case in the parser, a special case semantically. You have this expression in the middle of nowhere that gets executed multiple times for reasons that are potentially unclear to you. So in Grace, everything that can be executed more than once or that may not be executed at all is going to be a block. That's going to apply throughout the entire language. We had the same semantic model everywhere. No more questions. No more questions. All right, so we're going to support different teaching orders. So among the orders people like, some people like to have objects first. You make a bunch of individual objects and you have them talk to each other. Some people like to teach with classes first. You have a class, and then from that you manufacture lots of objects that all have the same code, and they all interact with each other. That, both of those are valid approaches. We don't want to prevent people from using either of those. That we want to enable them to use either of those, but we don't want to make the language any more complicated than we have to. So a class, in fact, is actually just a bit of syntactic sugar for an object that has a method in it that gives us back another object. So class of factories, the other thing that means is the classes are not types. So types in Grace are structural. They are just a set of method names, method parameters, method return types. An object belongs to that type exactly when it has all those methods with the right signatures. And if it doesn't have them, then it doesn't belong to that type. It doesn't matter whether two objects are made from the same, uh, the same site, they represent the same class, the same object literal. It only matters if they have the right methods. So you can make an object belong to a type long after the type was created, we can make a type that an object belongs to long after the object was created, or far away, or however you want. So types, we write like that. So we have uh, parameter types, variable types, written after a colon, return types written after a little arrow. The other neat thing here is that types are optional. So some people like to teach with types, and they feel very strongly about that. Some people like to teach without types, and they feel very strongly about that. There is little evidence to persuasively suggest that one of those is better than the other. So we support both. In fact, the grace is gradually typed. So you can have types somewhere and not types somewhere else. You can have all types, you can have no types. If you have types in one part of your program and not in another, when an object passes between those, that we dynamically check at runtime to make sure it's the right type, so that the statically typed code can rely on its static assumptions, and the dynamically typed code doesn't have to care about anything. If it's wrong, you get an error. You had an error in your program, so that's fine. We had a few tough choices to make in trying to put this language together. One of them is simply, are we building language to make teaching programming easier, or are we making language to, te make, pe to, teach, make, no, to make teaching programming the right way easier? So the right way meaning sort of the software engineering approach where, say, if you're teaching programming, what we really want is to have all fields, all methods, all everything be publicly visible and available by default. If you're following the software engineering approach, everything should be hidden by default unless you explicitly choose to make it open. So programming, you have less concepts, fewer concepts to deal with in getting going. Engineering, you're doing the right thing in some sense. It's not possible to reconcile both of those in the same language. So ultimately, we decided that we would have a mixture of the two. We would have 
methods be public by default, because usually when you create a method, you want to call it. And we have fields be hidden by default, because when you make a field, it's more likely than not to be part of the representation. In both cases, you can change that for a particular method or field and so on. Inheritance with objects is really hard. So there's the sort of obvious way of doing it, which is just delegative prototyping. That's what JavaScript does. That has weird action distance problems. There's concatenative prototyping, which is what Kivo does, which has weird self-capture problems, weird virtual method call problems, just weird problems in general. There's trying to duplicate what you get out of one of the other major languages, that kind of thing. That's also problematic. But as it turns out, a lot of people who are actually teaching various courses have managed to tie their entire teaching approach to the minutiae of the ordering of the evaluation of field initializers and the scope of field initializers and constructors in Java, or in C++ or in Python or in whatever language they're using. They managed to build their entire approach around the fact that a field initializer runs before the constructor or after the constructor, that it has access to make down calls, to make virtual method calls to objects that don't even exist yet. If we cut any of those off, we're going to cut those people off from applying the teaching style. I actually don't have a good answer to that. We have been through a lot of ways of doing inheritance, all of which are almost identical in almost every respect, except the weird corner cases that these people have built their entire approach to teaching around. So the hope is that we're going to be able to support them by some mechanism other than inheritance, because having multiple kinds of inheritance in language is not a sensible choice, I think. Then we have another different decision, which is, do we want to support one completely unified language where, everything, where everyone is learning the same thing, being taught the same thing, or do we want to have language variants where each variant of the language particularly supports this student and their learning at this stage with their course, with their instructor, with their everything else? Those are also in conflict with one another, and both of them in some ways are bad. So what we try to do here is try to support those variants, but try to support them in a very structured way. That structured way is called dialects. So a dialect is declared at the top of a module. You say dialect, name of your dialect, and that puts your module into that dialect. That, mo that dialect can both extend the language that's available to your module, to your code, or it can restrict it. It can say, actually, you're not allowed to write a variable declaration, a type declaration, not have a type declaration. Extend it, it can say, actually, you have some... I'm going to put you into my little graphical microworld. I want to start out with the graphical microworld and then move out of it. And we can do that within the same language because we have these dialects that will support the students all the way through. Importantly, this is on a per module basis, not a global switch. So you can have different modules in the same program, all of which are in different dialects. So the instructor's code can be written in the unrestricted language and the student's code can be written in a specialized dialect that maybe even only applies for this one week of their course. They have a different dialect every week. So that's neat. So in fact, we tried to embrace variation. So what we envisage is a giant lattice of different dialects. You think of that picture as a random sampling out of the middle of it. It's not important what's in it. The idea is that you can start out in a lot of different places. There'll be a lot of different things that you can learn first. You're going to have variables or no variables, types or no types. You're going to start out learning about just simple straight line procedural code. You're going to add some loops, so on. What can happen is there are all of these different dialects to start out with, and they all support what you're learning right now. And you can zigzag through all of the different dialects that are available. So you start out with uh, just straight line code. Then you add loops. Then you add types. Then you add something else. So there will be a, a lattice of variants of a language, each of which supports a particular combination of features, a particular combination of things that people want to do. And they can move between them uh, at will. So ultimately, everyone ends up either in the same standard unrestricted language, or they've gone beyond it. They've, uh, there are some other approaches where you do um, sort of a software engineering first approach where you have preconditions, postconditions, loop invariants everywhere. Maybe you can do that, and then you would end up beyond the standard language. So we can both extend and restrict the language. How do we do that? So extending language works by nesting. We already have the concept of objects. We already have the concept of lexical nesting, putting one thing inside another. So a module in Grace is just an object. It's treated as being implicitly inside one of those object literals. And so you can have methods and fields and straight line code to be executed and so on. The dialect declaration just takes your module and it puts it inside the module object or something else. So you get automatic lexical access to all the methods that are defined in there. So writing a dialect is just writing some methods that you want to be available and then it magically works. 
important part there is that you don't need as a, to know as a dialect author how to deal with parsers and compilers and all these other things that, in general, making this kind of language extension possible requires you to learn about. You only need to know the language that you clearly already know because you are teaching it. Hopefully you know it. And we have different dialects with different modules inside them, and our module A up here is able to access module B, C, and COP102, which are all written in different dialects, and that's all fine. So that's extensional dialects, languages that extend the language that's available. What about restrictive ones that take things away from you? The reason that we might want those is that... Let me go back, actually. Let me read that. Um, the reason that we have those is that there may be advanced features of the language that should be hidden from the user, or parts that aren't ready to encounter yet because of the teaching order. So to the end, I'm going to show you my favorite Java error. This is real student code, or adapted from real student code, and there's a real error in it. I won't ask you what it is, but here is the error message that is generated from this code. A quick show of hands, can anyone tell how to fix that error from the error message? Anyone? No one can tell. Don't feel bad about that. That's a totally unreasonable thing to ask you, but it's, if anything, a much more reasonable thing to ask you than it is to ask a student who has just started programming a month or two earlier. So what's happened here is the quite understandable error of the thread things incantation. They have copied a variable declaration into the body of an if that's not allowed. So Java, the compiler, had, Java C, the compiler, has decided that they're trying to make a reflective call on the fake class associated with the int primitive type, which is something I didn't know you could do until I saw them do it. That's not a reasonable thing for a student to be trying to do, but it is in the language because it is apparently useful in certain rare reflective instances that apply in your industrial strength code where you're using reflection all over the place. It's not something that's necessary for a student. Uh, I think a student would come out of university and they would never have encountered that or never tried to do that. They may have encountered it. And what happens when they encounter this is they write in .class. And then they get a different error. And then they end up so far down the rabbit hole that you can't tell how they got there. So in Grace, firstly, we try to avoid having those advanced features. But inevitably, there are going to be advanced features that are just more advanced than what you know right now. We haven't introduced you to variables or loops or what have you. And you've gone out on the internet, you've found some code, and you put it in, and you're confused about how it works. That happens all the time. That's not necessarily a problem, but we want to support students while they're doing it. So our, our dialects can have a checker method. The checker method gets run at compile time or statically or however you want to look at it. And what it does is it is run statically, given the parse tree or the syntax tree of the client module, and can examine it and can print out warning messages, can print out errors, can reject it, can do anything it wants. We also provide some helpers so that you can write those checkers easily. So you can write those in basically a declarative way if you have simple needs. If you have really complicated needs, you can write entire type checkers in there. In fact, the type checker of Grace is actually written as a dialect. So you can do fairly complicated things, but for the most part, you only need to do relatively simple things. But what you could do is some really neat stuff. You can give people an error saying, actually, not, you haven't been taught this, this feature yet. Or, you, are, you have been taught this feature, but you're doing it wrong. Why don't you look at section 2.5 of the textbook? Because I know what you're doing this week. I know what you've covered so far. I can tell you exactly where you need to go to correct your understanding. Right at the time that you've made the error. So you don't have to go and talk to someone else. It happens right here, right now, while you're trying to write your code. That's really neat. So I said that we wanted to support different teaching styles. And one thing that happened in Grace is that because we gradually typed, we don't have method overloading. You can't have two methods with the same name and have different things executed based on the type. It's also an object-oriented language. So people who, who organize their programs in a more functional, inductive kind of a way, they're kind of left on the cold by, by general OO languages. So we want to help those people out. To the end, we have a pattern matching functionality. So pattern matching is essentially, let's take a bit of data, let's examine it, and let's figure out what kind of thing it is on some axes, and then branch based on that. So this is an example of a, a simple pattern match. We have x, a piece of data, which I'm just telling you is zero or a string or a student. If it is zero, we're going to run the first block. If it's a string and it wasn't zero, we're going to match the second block and we're going to print it out. And if it's a student, we're going to match it. We're going to extract the student's name, the student's ID, with the student object's cooperation, and we're going to bind them and make those available to the code. So this is, for the, for the Haskell users in here, this is very like uh, what you might do with algebraic data types and so on. For the Haskell users, again, this is also monadic. I'm not going to tell you why, but you can be happy about that. So this syntax is very much like what you see in Scala. It's very much what, like what you see in languages that have it 
very deeply built in. But this is actually just a method, match case is a method. These patterns are objects that we have different methods available on. So this has been built in without extending semantics language, just with uh, methods and uh, very tiny extensions to allow you to write those, uh, those destructuring matches. Let's focus on just that middle block now. So, there's that one there, embraces, s colon string, arrow, print s. So that is both the syntax of a pattern match on something that I'm hoping is going to be a string, I'm going to bind to s, and the syntax of a block that just has a parameter called s that is a string. That's deliberate. We have the same syntax in both places because they represent basically the same thing. Because Grace is gradually typed, you can just pass a wrong typed object to any method, or to any block. What will happen is, if it's wrong, you will get an error and your program will die. Pad matching is a way of allowing the receiver of that object to indicate non fatally that actually that wasn't the right thing for me. You should go on and try the next thing. So what happens is, match case will try each of these blocks. In turn, the block will say, actually, that didn't match. Try the next one. I did match. Great. I am done. We can also do nested patterns, put patterns inside each other. Again, this sort of algebraic data type kind of thing. So this one here will match, at the top will match a point that has an x-coordinate of zero, so it's on the, the axis. And that's by putting a zero, the pattern that we already used, in place of the x, the, well, in place of the x-coordinate where we could have bound the name. And at the bottom we can also combine patterns together. You can say, this is going to be a point on the y-axis, or it's going to be a 3D point who is on the plane defined by this. That's with the vertical bar operator. And the ampersand operator says, I must match both patterns. Now, both of those are the same operators that we use for types. So in fact, if you have something that belongs to both the sequence and dog types, then you could name that type as sequence ampersand dog. And that will give you a strike that was both of those. If you use those as patterns, then you get exactly the same result. So again, we had this consistency with what things actually mean, where even whether you're using patterns or not doesn't really have to matter to you if it's not something you're actually being taught about right now. So how does that actually work? So you can define your own patterns if you want, and those are all built around this match method. There's a method called match that takes an object and it returns either a successful match or a failed match. If it's a successful match, it says, great, I matched, I have succeeded, and here's what I matched. The failed match, I didn't match. That's it. You can check what you got back and check what you can do with what you got back. This is basically just a non-fatal way of indicating an error. We can also use them at the top there in sort of a Boolean context. We can say, if point.match x, then do something. So that, that lets you use these features without necessarily having to introduce the concept of pattern matching. So we have different orders available to us. It's simply a, a way of testing things that you can introduce at any point without necessarily having to talk about the entire pattern matching syntax. Or you can introduce the pattern matching syntax and not the rest of it. We want to support both of those because they both represent valid teaching approaches. In particular, the ACM and IEEE work together to put out a curriculum for computer science courses. And it mandates that students must be introduced to both functional inductive programming and object-oriented programming at some point. So we want to allow both of those to happen within our language because, as we know, switching languages early on is a bad thing. Now, those of you who are familiar with JavaScript or other languages may look at the top part and cringe because you think truthiness is bad. So in this case, and possibly this case alone, truthiness is OK. So because in Grace, everything is gradually typed, and everything is structurally typed, true and false aren't special. They're just objects. They have some methods. What makes a Boolean is that it has the right method of a Boolean. There's nothing can be done about that. That's a fundamental part of the language. But what it lets us do is say, OK, I have these methods. Let's call them if true and if false. If I think I'm true, and you give me a block of code to run, I will run it with if true, and I won't run it with if false. Or vice versa if I think I'm false. So in this case, truthiness is not bad. Truthiness lets us extend the language in a way that is consistent and allows an end user to extend the language in a way that is consistent with their own teaching approach, with their own library approach, without necessarily having to pollute the rest of the language with magical rules that define what is and isn't going to be true. Okay. Let's talk about implementation. There are two fairly complete implementations of Grace. They both support, I think, everything I've talked about here. There's Minigrace, which was primarily written by me, although also with some significant contributions from other people. It's actually written in Grace itself. 
it's able to compile that Grace code into both C that runs on your machine and into JavaScript that runs in your web browser. The neat part about being written in Grace and then able to compile to other platforms is that we can then compile the compiler itself into JavaScript. So we can run the compiler in your web browser. You can just go to a web page and you can type in some Grace code. And you can run it right there in your web browser in the client side without having to have any kind of server interaction, anything else. That's really neat. Source code is available. The, uh, there are tables available which you can either build or use to build the source code because, of course, you don't yet have a Grace compiler. And you can go to that web front end. All those links are from that thing down the bottom that I've had on my slides. This is Hopper. <clears throat> Hopper is a, an alternative implementation that uses a concurrent JavaScript um, implementation style. So it also runs in the web browser, or it also runs under Node.js on your machine. And it uses this asynchrony to avoid one of the big problems that MiniGrace has running in JavaScript. That big problem is if you write some Grace code that is, say, an infinite loop, MiniGrace will quite happily generate you some JavaScript code that is an infinite loop. And then it will run your code, and then your browser will be sad. Because your browser will keep running forever, and it will never stop. Because JavaScript is completely single-threaded, there is no way that you can interact with the browser while it's running that code. So you can't have a stop button to so actually stop running now. Because that message will not be processed until your infinite loop has terminated, which may take some time. Hopper works in a different asynchronous way using uh, a set of callbacks, using the promises, or, or what you may also know as futures um, system that is in JavaScript. It had its own talk on Wednesday. I hoped to point you to the video, but it is not out yet. But you'll be able to find that if you are interested in the technical aspects of implementation of that. Both these implementations are open source. Both of them support everything we've seen so far. Uh, Many Grace has actually been used and is part of a course for teaching Grace to first year students uh, at a university just uh, well, a couple of months ago now. That went okay. The infinite loops kill your browser problem was a slight problem for them, which they didn't know about in advance. Uh, but other than that, things basically went okay. So the Grace link has been used in reality. We have some data on it. We're going to get some more data on it as time goes on. Hopefully, I don't know. I don't remember how American school years work, but whatever the next term is, we hopefully need some more. Okay, with that, let's have a look at a live demo. The most exciting part of every talk where everything's going to fail. So this is Tile Grace. This is a completely different thing than what we've really been talking about. This is the Grace language, but in the form of something that's more like, say, Scratch. So if you're familiar with Scratch, Scratch, if you're not familiar with Scratch, Scratch is a drag and drop uh, program editing system with a little graphical micro world where you can have uh, little sprites move around the screen, talk to each other, carry out different actions, and you program by drag and drop. So I can do something like this. Let's uh, make a variable. Let's call it x. Let's give it a value. And this is all so far extremely like Scratch. If you're after with Scratch, you're probably mad that I ripped them off. Okay, I can run this, and it's going to print out Hello World, which is great. Let's look at something a little bit more interesting. Let's load up uh, that one. Okay. So this here is written in a dialect. This is a dialect that provides uh, movement primitives. Uh, basically, it gives you a total graphics world. So we can write things in the micro world in a scratch light drag and drop way without actually having to use a scratch light drag and drop system that is restricted to a micro world. If I run this, it's going to draw a little housey, envelope shape. If I can drag these things around, these are, again, real. We need some neat stuff here. So all of these blocks correspond exactly to the underlying syntax of Grace. So in fact, if you just copied and pasted all the text here, you would get a valid Grace program at the end. Well, uh, indentation in the browser is a bit weird, but other than that, you get a valid Grace program at the end. That's not an intended part of the design of Grace, but it is something that kind of falls out of those principles that we saw earlier. We want to have single names for things, simple semantics, simple syntax. And what it leads to do is quite neat. So I can click this button here, and my tile code that I had there, much like in Scratch, has now turned to text. So I can switch back if I want to, and then I can switch back again. So this is real text. I can select it. I can do whatever I could do with ordinary text here. Let's change the program a little bit so that it's going to um, turn right 45 degrees and then move forward 50 units, whatever that is. So I can change that text, it's real text, and then I can go back into my tile view and my changes are still there. So run the program, it will now do something different. That is really neat. I was really pleased when I made this. Uh, so what this intends to let you do is use one of these drag-and-drop systems that sort of avoid the burden of syntax. 
Is it gone off the screen? Okay. Usually I do it, turn the wrong way and it just goes to the side of the screen and doesn't come back. Um, it lets you avoid the burden of syntax that people have trouble with when they start out, which is one of the things that Scratch is really good for. But it doesn't leave you stuck in this world where you know how to do drag and drop, but you don't necessarily know how to program in general, and you haven't, you're not able to keep using that system for long enough to build up the level of expertise that we require to switch from another language. The idea here is that you have a deliberately permeable barrier where you can use both text and tiles, switch between them at will, always understand that there's a correspondence between what you're doing by drag and drop and what you're doing by text. So when you move out of it, you'll have some understanding of what's going on. That's the theory of it. We have then run a user experiment using the system to see, firstly, will people actually use that ability to switch if it's there? So it's all very well, it looks nice, but if no one uses it, there's no point in having it. Let's come back to the slides. So I ran an experiment. I had 33 participants. They were primarily students, uh, so they are all fairly young. I think the, the modal age was 18. 30% uh, of them identified themselves as female. 70% identified themselves as male. They were, I think the, the median age was 20. So that's the demographics. And what happened here, we have a graph here of how many times each participant switched view as a histogram. So we had two people who never switched at all. Across an entire experiment, they did five tasks. We had two more who switched once, and then a big hump of people who switched multiple times. So it appears that people will actually use this feature that's available to them. Other feedback suggested that, in particular, people actually found just the ability to see the same code in two different ways to be useful, and would like to have that available all the time. So that much is good. There is a whole bunch more experimental data, but I don't want to spend the entire time on that. So at this point, I'm actually going to invite questions from the audience, and we'll see how that goes. All right. <laughs> Lots of time. Go. So the first question I have is about the graphical um, language. Yep. And I'm very curious, have, has anything actually been done to identify whether or not that is a more efficient way to teach people, whether you could flip back or forth or not, do people pick it up more quickly if they have to type arcane symbols or whether they're playing with Lego? I'm uh, okay. curious. Uh, yes, there has been some done. And like much research in this area, the results are a little bit mixed. Um, a, a problem has come up, which has been basically the, the, one, the switching language problem. People have uh, a lot of difficulty learning scratch and they're moving somebody else, which is a bit of an issue. Um, they also often have a problem where, when they're doing that, even if they did have a pretty good grasp of Scratch, as soon as they find it difficult, they uh, decide, I can't actually program, what I was doing before isn't programming, and then that becomes self-fulfilling. People do pick this up in the sense of they're able to write small programs that do things fairly quickly. So the original motivation was actually I went into one of the local intermediate schools, so that's uh, year 7, 8, so 11, 12-year-olds, and gave a Scratch lesson to them. And they love it. Kids really like it. They engage with it much more than anything else that you see them do. Uh, they're able to make small little games, small little storytelling scenes for themselves fairly early on. Uh, they, they do need some help in doing so, like just conceptual help in what does this word actually mean sometimes. But yeah, that kind of approach, it does seem to let people get up and running faster and experiment more than a textual approach to begin with does. It's not necessarily the best approach for actually, I'm going to teach someone and they're going to move on to be a real programmer, in the short term, but particularly for children, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, if you assume that this is good and um, that it's the best way, what would be the expected take-up rate? Like, how long is it going to take to get through all the bureaucracy of unis and stuff, and for have, to have unis doing it? So, what, the language as a whole, or the tile stuff? Oh, yeah, using Grace as a teaching tool. How long will it take to get through? Um, to get through all of them, infinitely much time. Um, there are still universities that are using Pascal, language universities that are using various kinds of lists, not even racket, but just old-timey lists. Um, people are very stuck in their ways and they don't want to change. So probably a very long time. Um, getting it into some, I think, is more achievable in, in the short term, and then we'll see whether it actually works. So I, we base this stuff on research and what we know about education. Probably there is wrong. It may turn out that when you use Grace in programming, teaching for real, Actually, everyone's bad at it, and it doesn't work. That would be sad, but that's you know, the reality of doing things, of doing research. I hope that we could get it into some universities. So this has been uh, built in collaboration between researchers at different universities. So I would hope they can get them into their own institutions relatively early on, and then if it works out, 
spreading more and more. But I don't have a timeline. The dialect stuff um, fills me with trepidation. Have you got any data on how effective that is? Or Because it seems to me like it's fraught. But uh, I wonder if you have any actual data on whether it's effective. Uh, so we have no data on whether Grace dialects in particular are effective. But um, there are other languages that have used similar approaches. Uh, SPK was a, a language that basically used a series of language levels to build up to, um, I think, PL1. Uh, Racket has a series of language levels as well. Those have shown themselves to be reasonably effective in not allowing students to go beyond what they are supposed to know at this point when they're, um, when they're learning. So that much has been helpful. I don't have research on Grace dialects in particular, but they, work, they build on the same concepts that have been used in the past. You've mentioned two languages that haven't taken the world by storm. Though. That's true. Yes, I have mentioned two languages that did not take the world by storm. Uh, what has taken the world by storm is Java, which well, is not a good teaching language. Java is very much on the way out in teaching, so I think using it as an example is probably a few years outdated. I have research. The, the suggestion was that Java is on its way out. I have recent research that suggests that is not true. As a teaching language? As a teaching language, yes. Uh, surveys of the teaching languages used in different institutions. Python is up. It is not up at the expense of Java. Uh, Java is pretty much holding its own at the moment. Yeah. Um, so the examples you've given so far are really great, you know, starting off the beginners with a scratch-like environment and, and all that. Um, my question is, uh, and you did say that this is designed to be a general purpose language, and one of the things that uh, in my experience, engages students is also to be able to do something that's useful in the real world. Uh, that could be, for example, to create an actual um, working uh, browser app or website or something. So um, my question is, do, does, do you have uh, an environment for Grace that lets the student do that sort of thing? There is the ability to write applications that will run in, we have at the moment, we have a sort of IDE that runs in the web browser. It's always used for that course. That lets you write uh, reasonably complicated applications, graphical applications. It doesn't let you do, let's write an application and distribute it to people. Uh, well, you can send someone your source code and they can run it, but I mean, you could do that, but we do not yet have that in existence. That would be really awesome, I think, if, yeah. if that... Also, there are also libraries for doing... Um, Asia. I wrote a bunch of bindings to like GDK Plus and so on that let you write graphical applications in Grace on a native machine, which I just forgot about until right now. But uh, yeah, you could do that. We haven't focused on that particular part of things yet, but that will come in time. Mm, thanks. Uh, when I was at university teaching uh, people how to program, and when we switched to Java, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of buzz. The students really liked it. This is a new hot language, and and uh, in terms of the you know attracting new students, um, it, it seems that students like to learn languages which they uh, they know are used in industry. And and even when I'm not at university now, but when we switched to Python at the University of Canterbury a few years ago. Um, the, the some of the students were going like, oh, this is a toy language. You know, I'd rather learn, you know, something a bit more industrially heavy. But um, it, it strikes me you're going to have a, a bit of a problem selling Grace to students because they'll say, oh, Grace, you know, I, I want to learn a program which everyone else is using or my mates are learning or whatever. That's true. Yeah, that will definitely be an issue. Some students really do want to come in and they just want to come in, basically get a meal ticket, and they want to go and learn whatever's in industry. Uh, on the other hand, if you look around the universities in New Zealand, say, and look around the industry in New Zealand, all the universities are teaching Python and Java, uh, except one. And all the industry is using C Sharp and Visual Basic. So it does not appear that is in reality actually a significant problem. They might moan about it, but they don't actually seem to stop coming in or care in reality. I don't have a good answer there other than that. Yep. Um, you said that you can supply a check that goes through the AST and can 
do basically arbitrary things to the to the student's code. Yep. Can you inject stuff into the tree as well? Yep. Like, could you do things? I was thinking along the lines of, if it's done more than ten thousand iterations, you probably best stop and pop up a, an alert. Uh, no. no, so you cannot modify the syntax tree when you do that. It's quite deliberate because macros have turned out to be a bit of a problem in other languages and want to avoid that kind of complexity. For that particular case though, you've run too many iterations. You can in fact provide your own implementation of the while loop that says you have run 10 million iterations. Are you sure you meant to do that? That's a totally reasonable thing to do. And that's supported by the extensional behavior, not by the restrictive behavior. So the restrictive behavior can only examine things, cannot change it. The extensional behavior can add new methods, and then if you call those methods, then you get the, those methods behavior. Um, I'd just like to echo the statements. I teach introduction to programming at uh, my local library, uh, so it's general public. Um, everyone balks at using a language that's not uh, in use. If, if they know it's a teaching language, th uh, that's almost the point where they feel like they're being spoken down to. Uh, um, as in, uh, some of these are mature age, some of these are uh, high schoolers, and um, if you give them a programming language like th that you're going to be using, almost the first question is, where is this used? And if it's not used um, in industry or for real stuff, they balk at it. Having said that, do you have dialects, like a, a Python dialect, a, a Java dialect, or something like so, that? Uh, all Grace code, all great, any dialect, Produces code that is uh, valid Grace code. You can't change the actual syntax of language in to the extent of having a Python system. You can change it to. Here is the most ridiculous thing I come up with, which is implementing an APL dialect, where you have some valid APL programs that are also valid Grace programs because we have operator overloading and so on. You can't say, okay, you're going to write in Python, it's going to behave like Grace. But you can make things that are reasonably close. Now, at the same time, um, the, the, on the point of whether it's a real language or not, that is an issue that will always be an issue for every language. One of the, the problems we have is that when you use one of these industrial languages, it's actually really hard to teach people. We have enormously high failure rates for students in learning computer science, learning programming, in basically every context and every teaching environment everywhere in the world. We don't have a good way of getting that across. So, a teaching language that makes it easier, whether they think they're doing better or not, is likely to actually help them. And then once they've been learning that language for a, a couple of years, which is the level of learning that it takes to be able to transfer it to a different language, then you can teach them a different language. Whether they want to do that or not is a different issue, and there is a marketing problem there. I am not a marketing expert. Yeah, if you've got a good standard response to that, that's not correct. I understand the use yeah. Okay. The comment was, if we have a good standard response, that'll be great. And was that a good standard response? And the response to my question was a general meh. So we should probably work on that. We will focus group it and put the marketing department on it when we have one. We done? Okay. Does anyone have a question? I'm good then. So thank you so much, Michael Homer. And I hope all enjoy this speech. And here's a little gift for you. Thank you Thank so you. much Thank for you. coming. Thank you.